Hello everyone, and welcome back to our series on sorting algorithms. In today's episode, we will be tackling a super interesting algorithm known as bucket sort. Without further ado, let's jump straight into it. The first thing to note about bucket sort is when you're going to want to use it. This is going to come into play later, but trust me, it's important to know now. You're going to get the most use out of bucket sort when the input data is uniformly distributed. What do I mean by this? Well, let's look at an example. Say we have a dictionary of students and their placements on an exam. The student with the highest score has a placement of 1. The student with the second highest score has a placement of 2. And so on and so forth up until an arbitrarily large value. Let's say that these students are randomized. And because of that, their placement data is randomized as well. How would we go about sorting this? You might be thinking that you should just use old reliable and go with quick sort, merge sort, or heap sort but there's something special about this data set that we can use to our advantage. Each element only appears once, and the data is uniformly distributed through those class rank systems. That is to say, the difference between the elements is the same. There's no skipping numbers or duplicates in the data set. There's gotta be some way that we can use these facts to our advantage, right? Well, if we made a video about it, obviously there is. And the way that we do this is through bucket sort. To be more specific, we can now formally define bucket sort as a comparison-based sorting algorithm which distributes elements of a list into a number of smaller sublists, i.e. buckets, and then sorts those individual buckets using another sorting algorithm. Bucket sort works best on uniformly distributed datasets where the difference between element values is the same or very close to it. The easiest way to picture how bucket sort works is through a quick real-world example. Take a standard deck of cards, shuffled. How would you go about sorting this deck of cards? Well, if you were somehow a human that was run solely by bucket sorting algorithms, you might try something like this. You first might recognize that all of the cards are somewhat evenly distributed, with values ranging from 1 to 10, then jack, queen, and king in that order. So, you might decide to make separate piles for the 1s, 2s, 3s, and so on and so forth. Then, you'd begin distributing the cards into those different piles, or buckets. A 7 goes in the 7s pile, a queen in the queen's pile, a 2 in the 2s pile, you get the idea. You'd keep doing this until the entire deck was separated into small piles. Then, all you'd have to do is pick up the piles one by one, in order, and you'd have yourself a sorted deck. Simple as that. Notice how we used the fact that each pile was going to be the same size to help us sort the deck. There were four cards in each pile, and we knew that there were going to be four cards in each pile. This is the methodology that is used behind bucket sort and how it actually works. Another thing to notice is how at the end of the sorting algorithm, we were able to pick up each pile in ascending order and get a sorted deck of cards. The reason that we're able to do this is because we knew every card in the 1s pile was going to be less than every card in the 2s pile, and so on and so forth throughout the, all the buckets. Now one thing to note before we jump into pseudocode is that the number of buckets that we use is not random. In fact, it's entirely up to us as the programmer. For example, we could have had the card separated into buckets counting by 2s. So all the aces and 2s would go into one bucket all the 3s and 4s in another, and so on and so on. And the same could have been done if we wanted to separate the buckets by an order of magnitude of 3. The only difference between those examples and the first is that after distributing the cards to each bucket, we'd have to go into each pile and sort them individually. This is because we'd have buckets which contain a mix of 1s and 2s, or 1s, 2s, and 3s, and so we'd have to straighten them out before picking them up to complete the sorted deck. Now since the piles are relatively small, this is pretty easy to do, and we'll see how this gets done in the code later on. The main point that I'm trying to make here is that the programmer must determine how many buckets are going to be made. Another thing you might be wondering is how we determine computationally how each element is placed into a bucket, but don't worry, we'll get into all of that in the pseudocode. Speaking of which, now that we have a general background of what bucket sort is, and have gone over a relatively simple example, Let's hop straight into said pseudocode. Bucket sort is going to take in two arguments when called. These are going to be the array which we want to sort, 
which I'll call r, and an integer representing the number of buckets that we want, which I'll call numBuckets. This is what I mean when I say that the programmer determines the number of buckets. There's no correct answer for the number of buckets that you should have. You want enough buckets so that later on it's easy to sort each bucket individually, but you don't want too many buckets, since then you run the risk of the sorting algorithm losing efficiency for larger datasets. You should play around with the number of buckets until you find a number that fits your dataset. Anyways, the first bit of actual code is to create a list called buckets, whose size is equal to the number of buckets, or numBuckets, that was passed into the function. This is going to hold all of our buckets in one place in memory so that we can easily keep track of them. Then we enter into a for loop. This loop runs from zero to the number of buckets. The purpose of this for loop is to instantiate a list at each index of the list. A list of lists? I understand how that might seem a little bit confusing, so let's take a step back and pull up a diagram. So, initially we just have the main list, the bucket list, which contains however many sublists or buckets that we want inside of it. This number is determined by the integer that is passed into the function. Then, inside of those sublists are going to be the elements of the main array which are going to be placed in these different buckets depending on their value. Going back to our deck of cards example, the main list would be like the table which contains all of our piles, and the sublist would be like the actual piles that we place those cards on. And then of course, the elements would just be the cards that are placed in each of those piles based on their value. Now that we have that down, let's go back to the pseudocode. The next instruction is to loop through the dataset from 0 to the length of r. This is going to access every element in the unsorted list. Now for each element in the list that we are trying to sort, we place that element into one of the buckets based on its value. Hold up a second. Based on its value. What does that even mean? That's another confusing point. So let's again back up a bit and talk about something that we've discussed previously on this channel, and that's hashing. Essentially, we want to have a function that is able to take in a value and then tell the programmer what bucket that value should go in. And in the long run, it should be able to do this such that the values are evenly dispersed amongst the different buckets. If this sounds familiar, that's because it's essentially the same idea as hash functions and hash tables. We take a value and then based on that value, place it in one of the buckets, with the goal being elements that are evenly dispersed. If you're interested in more of how this works, I definitely recommend checking out our video on dictionaries and hash tables, because it's broken down in way more detail there. To help you guys better understand this, let's go through an example which I think helps illustrate this concept very well. Imagine that there's a data set where elements are evenly dispersed, one integer apart, from 0 to 999. A good number of buckets for this data set could be 10, since the data set isn't too large. The goal, remember, is to have these 999 integers be evenly dispersed amongst the 10 buckets. What might be a good hash function here? Take a minute and try to think. One solution is to divide the number by 10 two times. Essentially, what this does for us is gives us the leading digit of any particular number. What we could then do is place that integer in the corresponding bucket. Let's run through an example. For a number like 678, how would this play out? Well, we take 678 and divide it by 10. In most languages, this would leave us with 67, as the remainder is chucked away, which is fine, because we don't really want it anyways. We then do this again, and what we're left with is 6, which is a single digit. And so the integer 678 would go in the sixth bucket. If you do this for every integer from 0 to 999, you'll find that it returns a value from 0 to 9. This is great because it corresponds directly to the number of buckets that we have, and since the values in our dataset are evenly dispersed, it will eventually lead to 10 buckets which each have 100 elements in them. Perfect. So that gives you a little bit of insight into how this bucket hashing works, and also what I mean when I say that this hashing method is going to change based on the dataset. That same hashing method that we just derived, the division one, might be completely useless in other scenarios. Choosing a good hash function is the crux of bucket sort, 
and will make or break the efficiency of the algorithm. Because remember, you want each bucket to have roughly the same amount of elements. Now we're finally ready to go back to our pseudocode and finish things off. Let's remember where we are. We are currently looping through the size of the dataset and calculating the bucket number for each element. We then want to place that element in the particular bucket of our buckets list. After this process concludes, we will have fully placed our elements into their buckets and hopefully have an even distribution, depending of course on how good our hash function was. What you'll see later on in the visualization is that this first part of the process essentially makes it so that the list is way closer to its finalized sorted state than it previously was. For a final step in the process, we run a selection sort on each of the individual buckets. After all these have completed, we will have a sorted list. The reason that this works so well is because of the way that our hash function was set up. Every single element in bucket 0 is going to be less than the smallest element in bucket 1, and this fact holds true for each bucket in our bucket list. So by sorting each individual bucket, as a byproduct, we are essentially sorting the entire list. Let's now go over what an example bucket sort might look like by sorting a list of 10 elements. Looking at our dataset, we can see that the numbers are spaced one integer apart, and so we can use this to our advantage. Now it's obviously not going to be useful at all if we have 10 buckets here like we did for our earlier example. Since we have such a smaller data set, I'm going to set the number of buckets as 3. Let's set up our main list and then below that are 3 sublists. These 3 buckets are stored at the 0th, 1st, and 2nd indexes of our array list. Now that we have everything set up, we need to come up with our hash function. We want to come up with a function which is able to evenly disperse these 10 elements into our three buckets. For the sake of this video, I'm just going to show you the one that we'll be using, which is a quite common one for bucket sort. As you can see on the screen now, we have a semi-complicated hash function, which might look like a bunch of gibberish to you, but that's okay. Let's go through each of the parts and describe its purpose. Let's start here. This part of the algorithm has us dividing the element by the maximum element in our list plus 1. Why? Well, if we want to get an idea of how well a number stacks up relative to other numbers in the list, we can do this pretty easily by dividing that number by the maximum number in the list. Numbers earlier in the list will have a smaller value, and numbers later in the list will have a larger value. The plus 1 at the end serves as a way to make sure that the output of this function is never 1 and that will be an important detail later. So now we have a decimal value telling us how far along the number is in accordance with the other numbers in the list. We now need to take that number and determine which bucket to place it in. This part is simple. We multiply the decimal value by the number of buckets. This will normalize the data to our specific number of buckets that we have set. The final problem we have is that some of the numbers that we'll get from this function are followed by a bunch of decimal numbers. This isn't good. We want our numbers to be whole numbers corresponding to buckets. The simple fix to this is to floor our output. The floor function simply takes in a double value and outputs an integer. This integer is essentially whatever the number is without the decimals behind it. It basically lowers the number to the floor, which is why it's called the floor function. And just like that, we have completed our hash function. It's a little bit complicated, but it gets the job done. So now that we have our hash function, let's finally go through the list and place each element in its corresponding bucket. Let's take a look at the first element, 2. The maximum element of our list is 10. So let's plug in 1 plus that, or 11, into our equation. 2 divided by 11 is basically 0.182. 0.182 times 3 is 0.546, and so our floor function gets rid of the decimals and outputs 0. What this means is that we place that number, 2, in our first bucket, at the 0th index. Our next element is 1. Now, I really don't feel like going through the process for each one, so let's speed things up a little bit. The floor of 1 divided by 11 times 3 is 0, and so we place 1 also in our first bucket. 9 goes into bucket 3, 3 goes into bucket 0, and our next element is 10. Let's pause here for a second. Now pulling up our hashing equation, 
Notice that if we don't have that plus one in our formula, this would result in the quantity 10 divided by 10 times three, which is three, the whole number. There is no third bucket, and so this would result in an out of bounds error. That's why we make sure to add one to the max element before we divide the current element. We accounted for this already, and so 10 goes into bucket two. Four goes into bucket one, seven goes into bucket one, eight goes into bucket three, five goes into bucket one, and finally, six goes into bucket one. Now, as you can see, we have three buckets, each with three to four elements in it. From here, we can perform a simple selection sort on bucket zero, bucket one, and finally bucket two. If we empty each of our buckets back into the original list, we have ourselves a sorted list. Now I skipped over performing selection sort on each of these lists because we've already gone over selection sort in a previous video. I've linked that video in the description if you want a refresher. Let's blow things up now to a massive scale on the visualizer. We're going to be running a bucket sort on a list with 1920 elements. To keep things simple, we'll also be having 10 buckets here, which I feel like is a good number for this number of elements. Once we start the sort, you'll see the process of bucketification going on first. Elements are being taken from the list and placed in buckets, which are then being rendered on the screen. If we speed things up here, we can see what it actually looks like once this bucketification process is actually finished. You can tell the list definitely looks a lot more sorted than it did before, but it still has a ways to go before everything is completely done. Let's unpause the video and slowly you'll see things fall into place as selection sort does its job sorting the individual buckets. As always, if you're interested, we'll have a video coming out later this week which has more visualizations, so look forward to that. Now, we have to talk about the time complexity of bucket sort. The time complexity of bucket sort is a little bit different than other algorithms. Let's first go through the different equations and then we'll circle back and talk about why each of them are the way that they are. The best and average case scenario time complexity equations are O of n plus k, and the worst case time complexity equation is O of n squared. k in this case is the number of buckets that we use. So as you can see, the number of buckets that we use is a contributing factor to the overall time complexity of the algorithm. Like we said at the beginning of the video, you're going to have to tweak the number of buckets in order to get a number that works for you. The space complexity of bucket sort is O of n plus k, since remember, we're defining lists for each bucket. These buckets are not in place, and so we need to spend extra space in memory to hold those values until we dump them back into the main list. Finally, we have the stability of bucket sort. Now the stability of bucket sort is going to depend on whether or not the underlying sorting algorithm is stable. So for example, in our pseudocode, we use selection sort. Selection sort is not a stable algorithm. And so in that case, bucket sort would not be a stable algorithm as well. Let's say you had used a stable algorithm though, like bubble sort. Well, in that case, bucket sort would be stable. Now, for our final segment, it's time to talk about common implementations of bucket sort. We talked about this a little bit earlier in the video, but we normally use bucket sort when the data is uniformly distributed. That is, when the differences in the data are identical. This comes into play in examples like the one we talked about earlier, where we have something like a class rank system. So while it may not be a very useful common algorithm, like a quick sort or a merge sort, it is still extremely useful in those specific cases. And that concludes our discussion on bucket sort. As a review, it is a comparison-based sorting algorithm which distributes elements of a list into a number of smaller sublists, i.e. buckets, and then sorts those individual buckets using another sorting algorithm. As always, if you are confused about any part of this video, please use the timestamps in the description to go back and re-watch that particular segment, or leave a comment down below with your question. I'll now be working on combining all of the lectures in this series into one large video, which should hopefully be out within the next month. So look forward to that. As always, thank you for watching.